You've got to be patient, you've got to be determined, you've got to have a fair bit of mongrel in you to say, no one's putting me down, I'm going to keep going. So, yeah, you've got all those things, all those factors, but um, just you just front it another day and you keep going. This is The Producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Ian Fullerton is a second-generation pineapple farmer on Queensland's Sunshine Coast. Growing 1,900 tonnes of pineapples a year is more than a business. It's almost a calling. Unflappable and stoic, Ian has opinions on employment policy, farming tech and the economics of agriculture. But in the end, there's one thing that makes it all worth it. Juicy, fresh pineapples, grown with integrity and pride. My name's Ian Fullerton. I'm a second-generation pineapple farmer, and um, the name of my property is Bonnie Rig, which is Scottish. Um, um, it's a bit of Scottish heritage there. Back in Scotland, the uh, name comes from a beautiful ridge, which was the original name in, back in Scotland. So, that, that's what we call this property, Bonnie Rig. Well, it's volcanic soil, it's undulating hills. The bushland is uh, very heavily timbered with big hardwood trees. It was a um, hardwood timber country years ago, cut a lot of timber out of here for housing. The, um, it's in the Glasshouse Mountains region, which is about oh, 14 kilometres as the crow flies from the coast, Sunshine Coast. A uh, very pretty country. Ian has a strong connection with this part of the world and he wasn't prepared to see the family farm go. He took it upon himself to preserve the family's pineapple heritage and power on. You used to drive tractors when you couldn't touch the pedals, but you could steer them and do things to shift them around the farm. And as you got bigger and older, you did different types of tractor work. And then as you got stronger, you did the physical farming work and um, you do that in the school holidays, etc. Then... Um, you know, you played a lot of sport. We're a very sporty district and uh, close to the coast. Did a lot of surfing and, um, yeah, good life. Good life growing up. I, the siblings were all very academic. And um, I was sporty and not very academic. And uh, I thought I'd do an apprenticeship or um, go and work in the mines. I had friends that went and worked in the mines and... And I would have done that, but um, I had um, elderly parents and the option was sell the farm or I take it over. And I didn't want to lose the farm. So here I am. It's still here. I originally grew pineapples for Golden Circle Cannery and I also grew bananas as well. And um, then I eventually changed over to all fresh fruit pineapples. Um, which is um, obviously the fresh fruit market. This year is 50 years farming. So I've, um, I was in uh, about 17 years old when I um, come onto the farm. So yeah, about, you could probably say 50 years thereabouts. I bought a, bought a third share when I was about 20, 21. By the time I was 30, I'd owned the whole farm. Did you know a different type of pineapple is grown for tinned pineapple and fresh? Ian has grown both and he knows all there is to know about the pineapple growing process and the cycles that keep the farm rolling. It's usually on average in South East Queensland around about 18 months to two years to get a fruit. So you start off with bare ground, you've cultivated it, you've um, treated it to make it right to accept the plant. You plant, there's three different types of plants, all come from the original. You have the top of the fruit, you have a, a little shoot that comes out you call a slip, or you have a sucker, which is um, similar to bananas. It's a shoot that comes up and turns into the, the main plant again once the old one dies off. So you can break those plants off and plant them, and all three make very good plants. And um, plant them, treat them, fertilise them, do everything with them till they get to around about 13 months, 12 months, a bit older in cases, 16 months probably. Then you um, get them to flower and then you wait about another six months for the flower to mature 
to a ripe fruit and then you harvest it and then you do the cycle all over again. The only difference is um, you're not just doing one plant, you're doing, um, you know, about a, on our farm about 1.2 million plants a year. So at any one stage, the maximum we have is 3.6 million plants on the ground. Some are bearing, some have just been planted, some are growing. And the least we have is 2.4 million. When we've finished the cycle and we've chopped them back under into the ground, mulch them, they go back as mulch into the ground. And that way you put a lot of nutrient back in the soil and start the cycle again. Acid, sugar, smooth, rough, different pineapple qualities make them suitable for different purposes. What were the market forces that saw Ian and many Australian consumers swap from canned to fresh pineapple? Well, um, they're two different types of pineapples. We produce a, um, a high sugar, low acid pineapple, which doesn't lend itself to be canned. You can can it, but it takes a bit of processing to can it. Um, the normal pineapple for canning is a smooth variety, which is um, way more acidic which is required for a preservative in the process of canning the fruit. So um, the hybrid variety we grow for the fresh market is a sweeter pineapple, usually all year round. It, it tends to be better in winter than the normal acidic pineapple. It tends to be a bit like battery acid in winter. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's basically the difference, and we... We used to grow two and a half thousand tonne for the cannery, but the um, the amount of money you could make out of that was diminishing pretty quickly. There was a lot of pressure with the imported pineapple. The um, fresh fruit campaign was growing a lot of momentum and people didn't want to have canned pineapple, despite the fact that it was very, very high in nutrition. There's been a lot of tests done to show that a canned product, whether it be beans, peas, corn, beetroot, pineapple, is very high in nutrition because it's a pretty quick turnaround from harvest to being canned. And then it's it's preserved, it doesn't deteriorate, whereas fresh fruit have got to be eaten pretty quickly, otherwise they deteriorate. So, you know, it was just a trend that, that was going on at the time and um, it was being felt financially by pineapple growers that grew cannery fruit. So the cannery was owned by the farmers and it ended up being sold to Heinz, which I believe is sold it to uh, Warren Buffett. But once that happened, um, it was no longer a pineapple growers company and there were different rules and regulations and become more difficult to grow under their um, conditions and uh so people went away from them, went to the fresh market, and uh, that's what I did. So you've got to make a choice, and I become completely fresh market growing. And we we grow less than what we did for the cannery. We grow around about 1,900 tonne. So it's um, when it's good, it's, it's good. I like growing the um, hybrid pineapples this year's, making it a little bit difficult, but... Um, It'll get good again. There are always jobs to do on the farm, many of them arduous, repetitive and labour intensive. But Ian always has his eye on the sweet, juicy prize, sometimes five years out. Well, um, harvest is a big deal. Um, that, that's time consuming. Um, not, as, not as hard, as heavy as it used to be, but still, you know, you've got to be... You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to pick the right coloured fruit, the um, fruit that, that's mature enough, just ready to be picked. Um, you know, these things get picked up pretty quickly when you start. Then, um, I guess, picking up plant material, uh, it's a bit hard to use, very tedious job. And then you um, getting ground ready and all that sort of stuff is, you know, that's just track to work, that's easy. Then um, planting is... Um, uh, a big deal again, very labour intensive, and um, it's not a quick job, but um, you just got to keep at these things and you get it done. So, there's no real thing that's difficult or nothing that, that's super easy, it's just constant planning, um, preparing, 
And um, a, a guy told me years ago, an old fellow that was an old pineapple farmer, and he said, when you were a successful pineapple farmer, you've got to plan five years ahead. And never been truer. That's exactly what you've got to do. Because, yeah, well, it takes so long to grow a crop. You've got to think, well, where am I going to plant next year's crop? And then when I... When I'm looking for the next year, the third year's planting, where's the plant material coming from? How much plant material do I have of the crop I'm about to harvest? To It's just coordination and um, um, that's about it, planning and coordination. Pineapples can be harvested in different parts of Australia throughout the year, ensuring there are always fruit to send to market. But as so often with agriculture, Climate and labour are pressure points, with some tricky pineapple supply periods on the horizon. To, to maximise a market, you've got to have continuity of supply and um, a pretty even amount of supply. So you um, have to stagger it the best you can. And um, the things that interfere with that are climate, obviously, and um, labour availability. Um, if you're having trouble getting labour, you get out of time, you know, get planted on time or you're, yeah, you know. So weather, climate and labour are the things that govern how well your sequence works out. But, you know, you you overcome problems as you get them. Um, it's difficult to overcome uh, climate problems, um, which we've just had. We had last summer, we had three metres of rain, which was... Um, a lot of people can't get their head around that, but you imagine jumping in a pool that's three metres deep. We had three metres of rain and that did a lot of damage. And um, it did damage to the plants that were growing because it it leached the nutrient out of the soil. It um, gave the plants wet roots and pineapple plants don't like too much water. So we got a lot of rotten plants. We got a lot of very weak plants. And um, the result of that was, we've, and then we had a very overcast period, not much sunshine to dry it out. And then we had a very cold winter. So we've, in southeast Queensland, we've, um, we're in for a devastating year next year. There'll be a big shortage of pineapples because it made all the different stages of the crops over the months, right through until September, October, it made all the plants flower. And um, really, um, we can't possibly pick all the fruit. Consumers possibly couldn't consume all the fruit in a short period of time. So it's a um, devastating year for next year, and it's a very, it's a very slow result as a, as um, a result of the excessive rainfall we had and the flooding. And it's difficult for people to grasp that because the pineapple crop takes so long to grow that. You can have a, a small fruit uh, develop because you had a drought two years before. You can have a devastated crop like we've got because we had flooding 12 odd months ago, 18 months ago. So, yeah, that, that's the extreme. We've never had that sort of extreme before. It's, um, it's been unheard of. We're, no one's ever seen it happen before. But, you know, it's, um, I guess, the first thing people will say is actually climate change. Well, Obviously, it's climate change, but we've always had climate change. So it's just one of those things we've got to deal with. And um, some people will say they're not growing pineapples anymore. It's too hard. And other people will say, well, there'll be a shortage of people growing pineapples. I'm going to grow them again and probably make more money out of them. So, you know, it's, it's farming in general. Don't, I don't care what you're farming. That's the way it goes. If a second generation pineapple farmer doesn't have the intel on how to choose the best pineapple, then who does? We get the selection lowdown from Ian. I know how to pick a good pineapple every time. Um, we just finished a crop, we've um, finished our harvest for the year, and I picked probably half a dozen pineapples and brought them up to the house. And, and I looked at them and I thought, well, I've got the best pineapples. All the guys working were all grabbing armfuls of pineapples because we knew it was the last for the year. And I thought, well, I've got the best pineapples because I know what a good pineapple is. They've got to have enough colour. Look, it's yeah, very difficult to describe, but I'll try. When you look at a pineapple in the shop, if it's a very flat-eyed, a very full 
looking pineapple. It's got a nice, fresh colour about it, not not damaged or old looking, nice and fresh. Where the stalk's been broken off is not too old. It's relatively fresh looking, or where the top's been cut off, still looks pretty fresh. Take that pineapple home and eat it straight away. The big mistake people make is they get the pineapple, take it home, leave it on the shelf until it completely colours, by then it's deteriorated. Pineapples do not have much starch in them or any starch, very similar to strawberries. So when you get that pineapple, it doesn't get any riper than what it is then. So same as a strawberry, you can't leave a strawberry to get riper. Get a strawberry, eat it straight away, it'll never get any better. Other fruits like some mango, stone fruit, full of starches, they'll keep ripening on the shelf, but pineapples won't. One of the, one of the bugbears I have with the fresh fruit market is the people, the retailers, want them a little bit greener, a little bit more backward, so that they last longer on the shelf. If you pick them riper, they get a bit upset because they don't have as much shelf life. If they don't sell them quickly, they lose money. So we're required to pick them just mature enough, just ready. Whereas for the person that wants a nice pineapple, if you got to eat it when it was ready, you'd come back for a second pretty quickly. So, so I look for that. You look for a fresh, bright-looking pineapple that's flat-eyed and full. You know, it's full of juice. It's fully developed, fully grown. And um, when you get it, you eat it straight away. Never going to get any better. And if you see one that's got more colour and it's fresh, certainly grab that one. That is a pineapple that was harvested riper than the green one. Yeah, we, we love them. And I know in a month's time I'm going to be asking other farmers around the place, you still got any pineapples left? Because, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get withdrawal if I go that long without a pineapple. OK, so we know how to choose the best pineapple. Now we just need to know how to cut it and eat it. Let's get the inside word from Ian. I cut the top off, cut the bottom off, put them on a nice cutting board, just slice down the shoulders. Don't take too wide a slice because you cut them in a, a cylindrical shape. Object, if you take too big a slice, you're cutting too much flesh off in the middle of your slice. So I have numerous little slices down around the fruit as you go around the fruit. Then I either cut it into slices or I cut it from top to bottom. Now, I often say this, um, I've got five kids, used to do a lot of sport. You cut up pineapples and you'd um, take them to the sporting event and um, You'd cut them in little rings, and when you'd open them up, my kids dived in and would take the bottom of the fruit, the base slices, because they're the sweetest, because that's where the most sugar deposit is in the fruit from the stalk. And they'd leave all the other kids with the top of the fruit, and some of them had heated, some would leave and say, oh, it's not as sweet. <laughs> so I thought, right, eh? I'll fix them. I'll cut it from the top to bottom so you've got fingers, so you get not so sweet to very sweet. So that way they all get taken, everyone gets equal amount. So there's your two tips. You either slice them in rings or um, you slice them from top to bottom and make fingers. To be equitable, top to bottom's the fairest way. You know, a, a bit of barbecued ring of pineapple on a burger, yeah, it's all right. I, I'm, I'm sort of 50-50 on that, but I just prefer it fresh. We'll, um, you know, kids growing up and, and that sort of thing, diced up pineapple with custard or ice cream or um, uh, what, rice pudding and diced up pineapple, that was a great treat, you know. Um, you didn't have to cook it, but if you cooked it, um, I can remember my mother would uh, cook them up and make um, pine pineapple meringue pie. Pretty good. Um yeah, pineapple crumble pie, all that sort of stuff. But I just like it fresh. There's nothing Ian would rather be doing, but that's not the same as saying life as a pineapple farmer is easy. It's constant toil that he hopes is valued by consumers around the country. It's a very intensive crop to farm. I don't think a lot of people realise that. I, I've met people in the past say, oh, you're a pineapple grower, what are you? sit under a shady tree with a bit of straw in your mouth well no <laughs> it's it's um i have um son-in-law that's a um cattle and grain grower 
and when they work really busy there um, 24 hours a day they do shift work and track to work harvesting cultivating whatever but then when all that's done and they've got the cattle they have a lot of time to do maintenance and just do other things but I've never really known downtime with the pineapple farm you you're we, we, where we are in South East Queensland, we tend not to have them over the Christmas period. That's our um, fellow growers in the northern areas. They grow them mainly over the Christmas period. And beautiful fruit. It's, it's more the tropics. It's a better environment for, um, for fruit over Christmas. We, um, we fill the gap nicely. We, we supply a pack house. That, that is a, a mutual pack house between North Queensland Central and southern Queensland and uh, it's the same pack as group so we tend to have con continuity of supply for the whole year because of our um, geographical location but in but when we don't have pineapples to pick we're busy fertilizing planting um, just in general growing so it always tends to be a busier time around Christmas because we don't have as much labor so it's very intensive for the few we've got doing the fertilising, finishing the planting, etc., and maintenance. So, yeah, it's all very busy. And um, labour has been a big factor over the last, well, since the COVID-19 thing. We, um, we never used to use backpackers. Then I used backpackers. Then I felt guilty because a lot of people say, oh, I've got to give an Aussie a job. So then I started giving locals jobs again. And, and out of the locals, 50% are terrific workers, really good. 50% are bloody hopeless. And um, I'm being factual. I'm not. And uh, then, so we went back to the backpackers. The reason why the backpackers are good is, and not all good, some of them are hopeless, but you're honest, you say, I'll give you a start by morning tea. If you're not good enough, I'll tell you, don't come back tomorrow, I want someone else. And you're very just blunt and straight with people and people appreciate that. But most of them are good and um, they've got a reason. They want to get their visa extended. So they've got to do 88 days on a farm. And um, so they've got a reason to work, whereas a lot of locals you get don't turn up on a Monday morning. You're you're dealing with a perishable commodity. You can't afford to be mucked about. If if you're set up to harvest, you've got to do it. And um, people just don't turn up. Oh no, it's been hung over. Or oh no, I had a flat tire. Or just didn't feel like it, mate. But I'll be in tomorrow. And it's just it's an attitude that drives you nuts. Backpackers are good. We had the first year of COVID. Uh, unfortunate for backpackers, fortunate for us. They ended up staying a lot longer on the farms because they had nowhere else to go. They couldn't travel, they couldn't do anything. Um, and they were very happy to have the work and stay on the farm. Then the second year, there was less of them and then um, it was hard to get them and we um, had to go back to sourcing locals. And um, you would uh, you would try and this is not exaggeration, eight people and you'd venture get one to stay for a few weeks, then you do that again. And so when you're employing 10 people, you go through a hell of a lot of people. Look at a pile of paperwork for tax deck forms and people starting that didn't, didn't do any more than half a day or half a week or whatever. And it's been very difficult with that. So um, I would like the backpackers to come back again. Or, or some policy change in Australian um, governments to, you know, make have people have an incentive to do a job that's not a pleasant job, but it's it's a job. So um, that's that's a very difficult aspect, and um, I can't see it not being a difficult aspect for a reasonable time to come yet. Um, we, we could go um, automotive, we could have automatic harvesters, planters and things, but we don't make enough money out of the pineapples. If you were a big corporate farm, you'd probably invest the money to do it. But as individual farmers, it's we don't make enough money overall to go mechanised, and it would be millions of dollars, and uh, you don't make enough money to do that. It's possible you could do it, but... Yeah, goodness me, they, they've got machines that harvest peas out of a pod. So you can harvest pineapples, but you, you've got to be in a big way, very big way. Nothing happens unless farmers grow food. 
But in this busy world, people don't always consider the work that goes into their meal or snack. Ian hops on his soapbox for a brief moment to tell it like it is. I, don't, I think people are too busy with their lives in general to, to think too much where something comes from and I'm guilty of that all the time and lots of people are. I think you, you're a consumer, you want something, you go and get it, you complain if the price is higher than it was last time and what have you, but... You know, usually with farmers, um, particularly prime producers, I'll I'll stand on a soapbox for a few minutes, but people seem to forget what a primary producer is. Now, I don't care whether it's a farmer, a fisherman, a forestry worker, a miner. The primary product is the thing that everyone makes money out of down the line. And somewhere the balance has been changed over the years. I think pre-war, post-war, Everyone knew what that balance was and primary production was the most important thing and they paid for it. But as time's gone by, it's more important for the people that value add to it and they forget that none of that would happen if they didn't have the primary producer. And if the primary producer doesn't make make enough money, they go broke, they give it away, there's no longer the primary product. So, you know, I often at meetings jump up on my high horse and say, It's a symbiotic relationship. You've got to give back enough to farmers to keep doing it for the rest of you to make money. And the same thing goes for a consumer. If a consumer goes and buys an item of bread, fruit, whatever it might be, and they say, oh, damn, it's gone up a few cents a a kilo or a few cents a loaf or milk or whatever, well, don't go and buy a new pair of Nikes that have gone up 200% in price. Buy the food that's essential you know, to keep everything going. So I do have a bit of a gripe about that. And the older I'm getting, the grumpier I get, according to my family. So I think I think that's just, I think the older you get, the more you see reality and think we're going the wrong direction. Our food is way too cheap in this country. I'm telling you, way too cheap. If people were to go and grow their own food, you'd soon turn around and say, I'd rather pay a few extra cents for that pineapple and have someone else grow it for me. You know, it's... It's it's a reality of life, but getting that message across, unfortunately, only happens when the the globe's in a crisis with war or famine or something, but apart from that, everyone rolls on. It's pretty good, you know, but anyway, time will tell. Ian Fullerton's Pineapple Farm is a family business of 50 years standing. His work is not without its difficulties, but it's meaningful and honourable. What does it feel like to do what he does? Without sort of playing it up and getting a bit and sort of soppy about it all, I think it's a very honourable thing, farming. And we're growing a product that we grow to best standard practice. We're ordered it every year. We do everything right. We look after our farm. We, um, We are as sustainable as we can possibly be. And because it's in our benefit, I grow a product that is healthy, it's, um, there's no negative about it. Everything is positive. And um, I think it's a very honourable profession. So you feel pretty good about doing that. Um, there are plenty of other things you can do, and I'm not going to mention jobs that you, you think sometimes, really, you can consciously make money out of doing that. But, you know, so farming in general and pineapple farming is very honourable, and I think it's a good profession. So you feel good about it. Ian Fullerton farms pineapples with passion on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. His work is complex in some ways. Long growing cycles, adapting to the vagaries of climate and weather. But it's simple in others. Growing food to sustain and please people is purposeful and meaningful. A life very well lived. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au. 